Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on Facebook. I'm Bryn Crispin with the Family Research Council, and we're live in DC for a special edition of Washington Watch with Tony Perkins. We'll be answering your questions throughout the segment, so please comment below with your questions. You can also submit them on Twitter using hashtag uh, Religious Freedom Day. Um, so stand by, we'll be beginning the show in just a few minutes. Good afternoon and welcome to a very special edition of Washington Watch. Today is Religious Freedom Day, a day set aside not only to celebrate our religious freedom, but also to cultivate an understanding of this fundamental human right, which is the cornerstone of Western civilization. Joining us today for this special broadcast of Washington Watch will be Oklahoma Senator James Lankford, who before coming to Congress was a youth minister serving as director of student ministry at the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma and director of the Falls Creek Youth Camp, the largest youth camp in the United States. Senator Langford was just recently selected chairman of the Senate Values Action Team. We'll also look at the international implications of religious freedom with former Virginia Congressman Frank Wolf, a tireless advocate for religious freedom. He is the author of numerous religious liberty laws, including the original International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. In our nation, there is a clear connection between religious freedom and social and political reform. We'll talk with the niece of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., our good friend Alveda King, and pro-life advocate Ryan Bomberger. And for this special occasion, we are broadcasting on the web and FRC's Facebook page in the presence of a distinguished live audience here in the FRC Media Center at our Washington, D.C. headquarters. So welcome to all of you in the audience here today. Let me set the stage for our program this afternoon. Religious freedom is our first freedom. It is enshrined in our Constitution, not as a right granted by our government, but as a right given to us by God to be protected and promoted by those who govern. Religious Freedom Day marks the January 16, 1786 adoption of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom authored by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson's work became a model for the First Amendment to our U.S. Constitution, drafted in the summer of 1789. In the 232 years since Thomas Jefferson authored the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, the lives of people around the globe have been enriched by its fruit. Religion and its free exercise have been fundamental to America's existence and to its success. As Jefferson himself said, quote, no nation has ever existed or been governed without religion, nor can be, end quote. That's a far cry from the Jefferson that liberals are trying to invent, a man they say was intent on divorcing government of all religion. In recent years, we have unfortunately seen an escalation of those who want to quarantine religious expression within the four walls of our churches or within the privacy of our homes. But that is not freedom. As President Ronald Reagan observed, quote, to those who cite the First Amendment as reason for excluding God from more and more of our institutions and everyday life, may I just say the First Amendment to the Constitution was not written to protect the people of this country from religious values. It was written to protect religious values from government tyranny, end quote. And that is why we celebrate this freedom today. But given the government-driven assault on this first freedom that we've seen in recent years, we want to cultivate among the citizens of this blessed country 
an understanding of how religious freedom is indispensable in the support of all of the other freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. And to help us to do that today, our first guest is Senator James Langford of Oklahoma. He serves on the Senate Committee on Appropriations and the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs, as well as the Select Committee on Intelligence. Senator Langford is a big defender of religious freedom. As I mentioned before his time in Congress, from 1995 to 2009, he served as Director of Student Ministries at the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma and Director of the Falls Creek Youth Camp, the largest youth camp in the United States, with more than 51,000 individuals attending each summer. Senator, welcome to Washington Watch. Very good to be with you. Obviously been on Washington Watch multiple times, never with a live studio audience. This is a great interaction. Point. Well, it's actually good to see you and not yeah. just hear you as well. on the phone well. with you, that's correct. That is right. Let me just start with this by asking you the question, what is the state of religious freedom in America today? It's a really odd season for us. Uh, religious liberty and religious freedom and the free expression uh, of your faith has been a given uh, throughout American history. And now for some reason people of our country and, and in this cultural time are becoming afraid of faith and afraid of people of faith. And so there's this work to be able to quiet in the, in the belief that somehow the separation of church and state coming from another letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote, clearly not in our Constitution, but another letter that he wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association, uh, this wall of separation. People are trying to put that up and to say, if you're going to have faith, that's fine to have it, but you need to have it in your church, right. by yourself, with your family. Don't bring it to your work. Don't bring it out in conversation. Clearly, don't bring it out in the public arena. Uh, that was never the intention uh, of the protection of faith in our country. Uh, we have always been a nation that you could not only have a faith, but you could live your faith, and that's dwindling away at this point as, pe as people are becoming afraid of people of faith. Well, the logical conclusion of that line of thinking or reasoning or lack thereof would be that people of faith could not be motivated by that faith to make a difference with that faith, right. which, quite frankly, you and the conversations that you, have, you and I have had over the years is why you're in Congress. It, it's a really stark back-to-back -back in this particular week to have Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, and that recognition now 50 years since he was assassinated as a pastor, as an outspoken rights activist, as one who spoke on the issues of poverty and of equality and of tearing down racial barriers clearly from a faith perspective, and he's respected by all individuals uh, within our nation today. And then right after that, a, a day recognizing religious liberty uh, in our nation and saying, why would we not allow people of faith to participate? There have been earth-shattering individuals like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who brought his faith into the public arena and challenged America by saying, hate doesn't overcome faith, love does. Well, where did he get that? He got that from scripture and from his own personal faith, and that bubbled out and has transformed our culture in many ways, and we're all grateful for that we should continue to allow people of faith to be able to live out the expression of their faith and not be afraid of that. Senator Langford, today uh, President uh, Trump issued a proclamation declaring today as Religious Freedom Day. And in that proclamation, uh, he said, our Constitution and laws guarantee Americans the right not just to believe as they say fit, see fit, but to freely exercise their religion, something you referred to earlier, not just to believe, but act right. upon those beliefs. And he went on to say, quote, no American, whether a nun, nurse, baker, or business owner should be forced to choose between the tenets of faith or adherence to the law. Yeah, no, again, this goes back to the basic principle. In America, it's not just that you can have a faith, it's that you can actually live the tenets of your faith. And one of the challenges that I talk to people about within the church is not the challenge of the church not able to live the faith, it's that individuals within the church are truly not living their faith outside of their church. The more that we practice integrity and that we practice the basic tenets of our faith, whether we're at home, whether in a business place, whether in recreation, we show a consistency of that faith. And people don't see one person at church and another person at the, at the business, right. but they really see faith lived out. That's where faith makes a difference. As I, as I poke people often and say, if church and faith is only something you do on a weekend, that's not a faith, that's a hobby. A hobby is something you do on weekends. A faith permeates everything that you do. And so when people live their faith as it is actually their faith rather than just a hobby they do occasionally, it has an impact in our culture. And I think that that thinking is, is dangerous when you look at here's one's personal life, 
one's public life, right. and there, there's this dichotomous view that the two do not intersect, it's hard to determine where someone's going to land if they're operating out of these two different worldviews. Yeah, and I've, I've had folks that have even poked me before that have said, you know, you were 22 years in ministry before, but now you're an elected official, so you need to set that aside. And I've smiled at them and said, not only does Article 6 of the Constitution mean I don't have to do that, which is specifically written towards elected officials protecting the living their faith, the First Amendment clearly does that. But quite frankly, it's one of our great frustrations with people that when they're elected, they become something different. If right. I was a person of faith Absolutely. at home, I should still be a person of faith here as well. Otherwise, I'd become something that I'm not. Right, because people vote for you, elect you based on who you are, right. not what you are forced to conform based upon the politically correct standards of Washington, D.C. Right. Now, l- let me uh, address this, or let you address this, Senator Langford. The issue of religious freedom, while it's sometimes thought to be a partisan issue. It is a bar- bipartisan issue. In fact, you have recently uh, introduced legislation uh, with both Republicans and Democrats to uphold this important principle of religious freedom. It is, actually. And there are multiple places that we've seen that. And over the course of the history of our country, we've not seen religious liberty be a partisan issue. Uh, go back three years ago, and we were dealing with trade agreements with Vietnam and other countries. I thought it was exceptionally important that if we're going to be in a trade conversation with Vietnam, we need to first bring up the issue of human rights, human dignity, and religious freedom. Uh, Vietnam has been a serial abuser of people and religious liberty. So I brought up a very clear principle. If we're going to have any trade agreement with Vietnam, we need to first deal with the issue of religious liberty first and to put that in a standard in our trade negotiations. That passed with a bipartisan, overwhelming, unanimous vote that wasn't seen as a partisan issue to say we should lead with that. If there's any piece of leverage we're going to have on a country like Vietnam to say you need to change your human rights principles and your issues of religious liberty, trade should be one of those issues that we use as a leverage. We had bipartisan agreement. We have other examples of that. Frank Wolf has led uh, for so many years in this area in the past, uh, being able to focus and build bipartisan agreements on the issue of religious liberty. We should continue to keep it that way. Again, in our country, For each individual living their faith out, it shouldn't scare someone that I live my faith out and someone who has a different faith is right next to me. As a government, we protect all of those individuals to be able to live out the tenets of their faith. The government shouldn't be partial in choosing one or the other. Neither should we restrict someone. And if you're confident in your faith, why would it intimidate you that the person next to you lives a different one? Live out the principles of your faith and let it make a difference. Uh, Agreed. And these examples that you um, have given also uh, speak back to um, what the United States provided in terms of leadership back to the United Nations in 1948. I mean, this is one area where the United Nations has actually gotten it right with their 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, in which they recognize that religious freedom is not an idea just for Western, the Western world. It is a human right. That was driven by the leadership of the United States. And I'm hopeful, and I want to ask you if you are, that America is going to restore its leadership position on religious liberty worldwide. I believe we can and we should. Uh, This goes back to Reagan's principle of being a city on a hill. There are people around the world that want to be able to just live out the tenets of their faith that they live in a country that doesn't allow them to have a different faith or has a different perspective and doesn't allow them to have faith at all. We lose track of how different the American experiment still is about allowing people to be able to have a faith and to live it even in greater diversity. Most countries of the world are not like that. Uh, We're at our best when we're promoting that. Sam Brownback, who's uh, governor of uh, Kansas, is going through the process right now to be selected as the ambassador at large for religious liberty. It's exceptionally important that he passes through the Senate. Our push is to get him through next week so he can get on the task. So he's working with every embassy in the world to say to every embassy in every location, whether you're Saudi Arabia or whether you're Canada, to say this issue of religious liberty should be a part of the conversation. We're modeling it. We need to set the example for that in America and then help push other nations uh, to consider it within their own nation. We're going to talk more about that in a moment with uh, Congressman Frank Wolf. Senator, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for all that you do on Capitol Hill, uh, leading in the Senate on the values issues, but most importantly, as we recognize today, religious liberty. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for taking the lead on this publicly as well, Tony. All right. Uh, Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. All right, don't go away, folks, because we're coming back with more of this special edition of Washington Watch with a strong defender of religious freedom, former Virginia Congressman Frank Wolf, to discuss religious freedom around the globe.
Hey everyone on Facebook, thanks for joining us. My name is Bryn Crispin with the Family Research Council and I'm standing here with Ryan Bomberger who is the head of the Radiance Foundation. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. We just celebrated the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. How did religious freedom play a role in his fight for equality and justice as a pastor in 20th century America? It was everything. I mean, there wouldn't have been a civil rights movement without religious freedom. I mean, there were constant invocations to the, the creator of the universe, uh, constant appeals to heaven. I can't imagine there being any kind of civil rights movement without Martin Luther King Jr. and many other civil rights activists appealing to God uh, for the church, at least those churches who were actually involved, <laughs> who were courageous enough to, to stand against the status quo, they were instrumental in it. And without religious freedom, there could not have been that expression. There could not have been the peaceful kind of protests. Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent approach never would have existed without religious freedom. And I know you were instrumental in rallying support for the Jack Phillips case outside the Supreme Court recently. Um, you could have stayed out in the cold, it was November, but you decided to rally support and you were there and you were supporting him. Um, why was this case so important to you and to Americans? Freedom, <laughs> I mean, just basically freedom. I mean, you look at so many of our freedoms being eroded, complacency can never be the response, apathy can never be our response. As a creative professional, it blows my mind to think that the government gets to dictate when and where you use your artistic talents. And that's just, that's too much for me. So my wife, Bethany, and I, and through the Radiance Foundation and with the coalition of so many other groups, including Family Research Council and Alliance Defending Freedom and, and Liberty Council and many others, uh, stood for, with Jack Phillips on the 5th, out in the cold, outside of the Supreme Court, because we believe, uh, as Senator Lankford said earlier, there, there isn't a dichotomy. There isn't the, the sphere of, of faith where you're allowed to live it out and then there's a separate one in the public. Uh, those things are one and the same. And so I can't help but uh, my wife and I felt compelled that we had to be involved. We had to fight for religious freedom. And it's interesting because it's both. It's religious freedom and it's free speech, the two first rights enumerated. Uh, one doesn't work without the other. And so we are more than, than happy to stand with Jack Phillips in this case as Masterpiece Cake Shop case. And we're hoping that the Supreme Court <clears throat> does not rule supremely wrong as they have many times, um, but that they rule in favor of, of freedom. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us and com continue to um, ask questions on Facebook. We'll answer them next time around. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Special edition of Washington Watch today before a live audience here at our media center at the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. This is Religious Freedom Day, and that is what we are talking about. In 1998, the Congress passed, and then President Bill Clinton signed into law the International Religious Freedom Act, which, among other things, elevated the importance and the priority of the promotion of religious freedom in America's foreign policy. The law was recently amended to be given even greater influence and significance in international religious uh, freedom and our activity, and its name was changed to the Frank R. Wolf International Religious Freedom Act to honor our next guest, former Virginia Congressman Frank Wolf. Congressman, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thank you, Tony, good to be with you. Now, Congressman, early on in your career, you worked to assist Christians in Romania who were being persecuted by that country's uh, dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu. That, uh, that work involved removing most favored nation status uh, from Romania as a consequence uh, for their behavior. We were just talking about that with Senator Langford about the connection of economic activity and religious freedom. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that experience shaped your interest in religious freedom and human rights in Congress? Uh, that shaped it tremendously. But before, can I say this? I, I appreciate Senator Lankford's efforts. If, if every senator were like Senator Lankford, I think it'd be a lot differently. Secondly, read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. It is one of the most powerful things you will, you will ever, ever read. Uh, the trip uh, with me on the trip was uh, current Congressman Chris Smith, 
who is a hero, and uh, Congressman Tony Hall. We went to Romania in 1985. Uh, I had almost never been out of the country. I think I'd been to Canada once before I uh, got elected to Congress. It was a life-changing event. We went into churches, Second Baptist Church of variety of people came up and put things in my hands, and my husband's in jail, my son's in jail. Ceausescu was one of the most evil people. It was darker in Bucharest than it was in, in, in Moscow. We came back, uh, we got ridiculed by the Ways and Means Committee, and we had one guy with us. The Reagan administration wanted to keep most favored nation status, but one man named Ronald Reagan wanted to take it away. We met with President Reagan, and this, the story is we took it away, and President Reagan helped us. One person, Reagan said the words in the Declaration of Independence and the words in the Constitution were a covenant, not only with the people of Philadelphia in 1776 and 1787, but a covenant with the entire world. So Reagan really went against his own Secretary of Commerce, and we took it away, and it helped collapse the Ceausescu administration. But from there, it went on to the Soviet Union. We did in 1989. Chris Smith and I went to Moscow, and we asked to go into Prim Camp 35. That was the camp that, that Sharansky was in. Uh, I've met with Sharansky a number of times. Sharansky said when he heard Ronald Reagan, they used to tap on the wall with spoons, when he heard Ronald Reagan give 1983 National Association Evangelical Speech in, in Florida, where he called the Soviet Union what? The evil empire. It changed right. everything. We went in, in it was in... Uh, Summer of 80, 89, uh, we went into the Shizo, we took people out, we interviewed uh, Sharansky's cellmate, who Sharansky had since left. Remember, Sharansky got out, and it was a, a trade. He was on the Gleinigan Bridge, remember, in, in Berlin, and they told him to walk straight, and he zigzagged back and forth. A strong man, Sharansky. Literally, we found that it, amazing things were happening, and the people there knew more about Reagan because of him speaking out. But it was, a, again, a life-changing experience. Perm Camp 35 in the Ural Mountains, Gulag. We stayed through the night. Chris Smith and I, we gave out Bibles. And three of the men that we met with, the first man came up to me. He said, I work for your government. And I came back with the CIA. And they finally, these were three guys who had been working for us who were put in the Gulag, and our government had even neglected. But that was, again, a life-changing trip. Again, Chris Smith. God bless, we want Chris Smith to stay in Congress till he was yeah. 150 years old. But Chris is <laughs> on, on, on that, that trip. We're, we're, we're up against a break. We're going to come back and continue this conversation because I, I want to ask with um, the perspective that you have, having served in Congress all of these years, going back to the Soviet Union, going back to Romania, these incidents that you just uh, relayed to us, where is religious freedom today? Is the population of the world better protected when it comes to religious freedom? Or is religious freedom in greater risk today than it has been in the last 40 or 50 years? Greater risk. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, the same. We had Henry Hyde. You remember Henry? We had Jack Kemp who would get up on the floor with passion. We had Tom Lantos. They're all gone. I, th I think we have uh, five and a half billion people living under a religiously repressive nation. In 19, from 80 to 81 to 88, if any law firm in this set town said they're going to represent the Soviet Union, Reagan would have cracked down on them. Squires, Patton, Boggs, have you looked at their list? They represent Sudan. They represent Bashir, who is an indicted war criminal. Indicted war criminal. And yet they have the most powerful law firm in the city represent them. They represent China. In China, you have Tibetans in jail. I snuck into Tibet. The Buddhists are being persecuted. The Uyghurs are being persecuted. Catholic priests in jail. Catholic bishops in the house. It is worse off because we don't have the leadership then and now that we really have. Are you hopeful that we may be at a point of change? Uh, I am. St let, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to take that up on the next, <laughs> when we come back. Folks, don't go away. We're coming back. Uh, in just a moment with more Washington Watch. Let me encourage you to check out the website, TonyPerkins.com. Also, you can watch on Facebook as well. So don't go away. We're coming back with more of our conversation with uh, Congressman Frank Wolf. Um, 
on the other side of this break. And uh, let me remind you, this is a special edition of Washington Watch as we observe National Religious uh, Freedom Day, uh, a very important day. And I'm gonna ask Congressman Wolf about this as well. Relatively new, going back to 1993, the first time that a president issued a proclamation declaring Religious Freedom Day. So we're gonna talk about that and more when we return with this special edition of Washington Watch. Hi everyone on Facebook, thanks for, so much for joining us. I'm Bryn Crispin with the Family Research Council and I'm here again with Ryan Bomberger of the Radiance Foundation. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining us again to answer some questions. Yeah, it's great to be here, a great conversation. Um, so I know your organization, the Radiance Foundation, um, specifically highlights the injustice of abortion. Can you talk a little bit about the connections and similarities between the pro-life movement and the movement to protect religious freedom in this country? Yeah, I mean, there there are many connections there. I mean, obviously, freedom being uh, the most important, the pursuit of truth. Both movements are pursuing truth. Uh, without truth, there can't be any justice. Um, so they're tied that way. Both movements, at, at the heart of it, uh, look out for providing a voice for the weak. And, of course, with the pro-life movement, who is the weakest among us, the most defenseless, uh, the unborn. But when we talk about religious freedom, we talk about persecution. Now, I know we as Americans probably don't see it as, as, you know, as blatant as it is in many other countries, but there's persecution around the world. So there are so many things that connect uh, the two, but I would say primarily it really is the pursuit of truth. That's what we, that w that's what we want and the justice that falls uh, in line once we do obtain and express that truth. Can you, real quick, just explain your shirt for us? Oh, yes. Less activism, more factivism. I should have got it, you know, one for everybody. Less activism, more factivism. See, we have a culture, and I laud those who want to do something about injustice when they perceive an injustice. I laud those who, who act, who don't just sit on their backsides and don't do anything. However, we have a society now who acts without the facts so many times, and there's, there are dangerous consequences to that. So we just, we emphasize the fact that Emotions don't set us free. Uh, the truth sets us free. And so I'm a factivist. I believe we strongly We have to wrap it up because the radio show is about to kick back oh, in. Oh, more factivism with Tony. Thank I you so wait. much for joining us. <laughs> and back to you, Tony. Welcome back to this special edition of Washington Watch here before a live audience at the Media Center at the Family Research Council here in Washington, D.C. My guest, former Congressman Frank Wolf of Virginia, the author of the initial International Religious Freedom Act back in 1998. Uh, I, I want to continue our conversation, Congressman. You were, you were talking about what is happening in terms of religious freedom and how so many people are living under repressive governments today. Are you optimistic that we could be at a turning point, that change may be on the horizon? One of the, the, um, uh, the, the bill was amended, the act was amended to be called the Frank R. Wright, uh, Frank R. Wolf, uh, International Religious Freedom Act to impart and partially uh, strengthened to make the ambassador at large for religious liberty uh, dr responding directly to the Secretary of State. So there, are, there has been some action. Are you hopeful under this administration we may see a relief to those being persecuted for their faith around the globe? I'm, I'm hopeful under the administration, and I think you have to give a lot of credit to the administration, and particularly to Vice President uh, Pence, what he's done on the, on the Iraqi situation. I mean, they've completely re reversed it. I mean, so he is putting aid in to help the Christian to remove. Overall, you know, one, God can do whatever he wants to, to, to do. I mean, I pray every night for a spiritual awakening. 
I have five kids, I have 16 grandkids. I've been going around on the college campuses. I'm not that encouraged though. I gotta tell you, when many law firms in this town will take on the most sleaziest, I mean, when Patton Boggs takes on a, an indicted war criminal, you gotta wonder where we're going. Secondly, Sam Brownback is one of the greatest guys we could ever have. His nomination has languished there. He was nominated during the summer. Right. Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican, and he hasn't really gotten confirmed yet. I was encouraged to hear uh, the senator say. Thirdly, Chris Misbill, H.R. 309, is languishing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Chris passed it last June. This will have money to investigate the genocide. I had a young Yazidi girl come by and say that the man who held her in Raqqa was an American citizen who used to show her pictures of his wife and kids on her cell phone. Chris can't get his bill out of the Senate. So, I, and lastly, I go on to some of these college campuses, Christian colleges. These kids are really not that interested. So yeah, I think we need some men like Martin Luther King. I, 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 I think we need pastors to go to jail. I am disappointed in the church. There are exceptions. Cardinal Dolan's been great. Uh, there are a lot of exceptions. But overall, the church has fundamentally failed. After the first bill passed, most churches used to have a religious freedom Sunday. They would bring in somebody from Sudan and China. Now they're almost all gone. So I am not that encouraged. But God can move quickly. Uh, and maybe the Trump administration and, and, and Pence. I mean, Pence is a good guy. I mean, I, I once sat on the floor and I told Pence, if he ever ran for president, I'd, I'd be for him. And so Pence can maybe, but unless there's a change in hearts and minds of the people, and I think the fundamental failure has really been the church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, you know, I mean, he looked around. If you don't speak, you don't act. And I don't see the church speaking, and I don't see the church acting. That's why I urge you. If anything comes out of this, read Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Every pastor, priest, and rabbi ought to read that letter. Lastly, have you seen the anti-Semitism around the world? There's anti-Semitism There's anti-Semitism on the American college campuses. This whole boycott, divestiture, and sanctions is soft anti-Semitism. I have not seen any religious leader speak out against, against it. So... God can do it. God can answer a prayer, but I am not that optimistic at this moment. Well, let's talk then in, our, in the few moments we have remaining. What should churches and pastors be doing? What can our listeners do to address this issue? And by the way, this program that is now five years on a daily program in large part went from a weekly to a daily because of a conversation I had with you a number of years ago about needing to get this information out there and into the hands of Christians. So what do they need to do? Well, you know, and I appreciate what FRC, that one pray, if, when you go with the religious dissidents in other countries, you always say, as you leave, what can I do? They say, pray for me. What else? Yeah. Well, pray. True. So you can pray. Secondly, you can work with groups like Voice of the Martyrs and open, open doors. Thirdly, you can contact your congressmen and senators. Have a, have a religious freedom day at church. Invite in different people. I believe this needs to be both a spiritual issue and it also needs to be a political issue. You need to take this into the political environment. I mean, why is, is Christmas bill being blocked in the Senate? Why is Sam Brownback not? I mean, Brownback was loved by all the senators. So there's a lot that each individual can do. But I think it may really boil down to, and I'll go with them. You really might need to be some pastors and some priests and rabbis to do really what Dr. King did. They may very well have to go to jail to wake up this country. And back to domestic issues. If you're a, a committed person and you believe in marriage is between a man and a woman and you work for a high-tech company and you tell that in the high-tech company you work for hospitality and ooh, you're not going to go very far. So we have some fundamental problems in this country as well as outside. And we have to lead by example, and that's why we must defend religious freedom at home to give hope and encouragement to those around the globe. And I will echo what you said as I was recently in Egypt meeting with Christians there. The first thing they said, pray for us. Pray that we will be bold and courageous, not unlike the words of Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6. Congressman, as always, great to have you on the program. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, sir. All right, folks, don't go away. We're coming back with more of this special edition of Washington Watch with 
Alveda King and Ryan Baumberger on the other side of this break. So don't go away. We're back with more after this. Hi hey everyone on Facebook, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Bryn Crispin with the Family Research Council and I'm standing here with Congressman Frank Wolf. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us to answer a few questions. Glad to be with you. Uh, first question I had, which you just talked with Tony a little bit about, what's one thing that the church in America can do to help persecuted Christians around the world? Pray, number one. Number two, work with groups like Open Doors, uh, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, Samaritan's Purse. I mean, Samaritan's Purse is doing amazing work. Samaritan's Purse literally may be the one with Sister Diane, a Catholic nun, that will save Christianity in the cradle of Christendom. You know, the Christian community in Iraq, one and a half million, now down to 200,000, they were leaving. What Pence is doing in the administration. So there's a lot that can be done. Mm. And what would you say to the person watching at home who's not involved in politics, they feel like their religious liberty rights have not been violated, and they're just asking themselves, why should I care? Well, they should, one, wherever there is persecution taking place in a country, that's a country that we're generally having some, some tension with. Secondly, there's a Catholic woman, Aza Bibi, Google, Aza, A-S-I-B-B-I-B-I. -B -B -I. She's in jail in Pakistan under a death sentence sentence for seven and a half years and we still aid and give all this money to pakistan contact your congressman contact your senator come to washington invite them when they come back and if you don't want to come to washington invite them to the church ask him senator why have you done anything for asia bb why haven't you done anything on all pakistan? right we have to there's wrap a it lot up. that you can do we're heading back to the show now but thank you so much for joining us thank and you and thank you all Welcome back to this special edition of Washington Watch. So glad that you are with us as we observe, celebrate, and cultivate a better understanding of religious freedom in this country. By the way, breaking news on the religious freedom front, uh, Senator Steve Daines just introduced the Senate Resolution 32 affirming Religious Freedom Day and what it stands for in the Senate. So good to see activity, as Congressman Wolf was talking about, to see members of Congress speak out on this issue and, and act. And by the way, I'd add another item uh, to that to-do list is uh, contact your senators and encourage them uh, to support uh, the confirmation of, Sen of uh, former Senator, now Governor Sam Brownback of Kansas as the ambassador at large for religious freedom. So contact your senators and encourage them to move that forward. Well, when you dissect the major social and political reforms that have occurred in this country, you often find at their heart religious conviction and expression. The uh, abolition of slavery, the civil rights movement, two prime examples of the power of religious freedom. Just yesterday, the nation celebrated the birth of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose preaching stirred the conscience of a nation and today, we're honored to have the niece of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with us here today. Joining us now is Dr. Alveda King, pastoral associate with Priest for Life and director of civil rights for the unborn. Alveda, welcome to Washington Watch. Hello. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm in an airport. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, Alvita. So good to have you with us today. I thank you for taking time. I know you're on your way to Washington uh, to be a part of a number of the pro-life events today. Uh, let me ask you, we've discussed this briefly, but the connection between the civil rights movement and religious freedom. Tony, when we consider religious freedom in the 20th century, of course, I actually marched for open housing, went to jail with many of the leaders. A few of us are still here today. My uncle led that movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Uncle M.L., and my daddy, Reverend A.G. King. Now, we were not at that time fighting for religious freedom. For most of the movement, we still had prayer in schools, although it was taken out in 1963. Abortion did not 
become legal until 1973. So we had a climate where we could pray in the public square and appeal to God to preach in the pulpits about the Bible and sin. We were dealing with skin color racism, which is a problem based upon the misconception. I'm so sorry about that. Please, sorry about that. You go right ahead. Um, but dealing with the skin color issues, thinking we're separate races, whereas the Acts 1726 says we're created of one blood. But we were not fighting over the Bible and preaching the gospel so much at that time. I believe, remember when Family Research Council was one of the first louder voices saying, Something's wrong in America. They're taking away the 501c3s. They're trying to keep the preachers from preaching the truth of the gospel in the inside the four walls and out. So I'm so glad that that alarm was continually sounded, uh, sounded and that many of us, uh, priests for life included, including we have fought for religious freedom on the matter of preaching the truth about abortion. And we had that lawsuit where we prevailed along with the Little Sisters of the Poor and others. So there is a correlation between civil rights and religious rights and religious freedom. We're not trying to keep others from practicing their beliefs, but we want to be able to practice ours. Well, you have been a, uh, a just a, such an effective advocate for the unborn. That comes out of your conviction, uh, both your personal experience, but also your religious conviction. And you should not be deprived of that conviction when you walk into the public square. We should not be. And speaking of that, because on all of your breaks, you're, you're making the appeal to those on Facebook to be involved and be included. Many of you know there's a new movie coming out, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade. I'm one of the executive producers. Facebook has pulled down our ads, the paid ads and the any mention in the uh, non-paid ads. And they do not want the message of the injustice of abortion broadcast, and they are trying to block that. That's another violation of religious freedom. It's very discriminatory. So when we are denied the opportunity and the right to proclaim the gospel freely in this nation that was founded upon in our Constitution, we have that right. It's a terrible injustice. My uncle did say injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and I know we can all agree. So it's wrong to take the life of a baby in the womb. It's wrong to silence the voices of people who want to proclaim our faith. And all of those are civil rights injustices, but they are uh, an injustice against God's will. And so I'm very grateful that this type of uh, information uh, conversation is available, but I'm asking everyone to please support. Uh, there'll be other movies coming out that are telling the truth about the social injustice of silencing the voices of faith in this nation. And so we must continue to cry out. Well, Dr. Avita King, thank you so much for taking a few moments to join us. We look forward to seeing you this week here in Washington, D.C. as uh, we march for the unborn and for the right to life. And I just want to say thank you for all that you have done to stand up and be a voice to all of the nation. And uh, you bring such credibility because of uh, who you are and the family that you come from. And we're grateful for you, Dr. Alveda King. Thank you for this opportunity. God bless everyone. All right. Dr. Alveda King. Well, let's bring in Ryan Bomberger. He is the chief creative officer with the Radiance Foundation, an organization focused on restoring and protecting the rights of the unborn and uh, using a creative message to do that. And he's one of the most creative geniuses I've seen. It's uh, Ryan, it's great to see you. Great to be back on, uh, to have you back on the program. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the uh, compliments. You, you build up my, my self-esteem, thanks. Well, look, I don't know that I need to build you. In fact, by the way, uh, I actually write about uh, Ryan in uh, the book, No Fear, I Tell Your Story. So if you wanna hear all of the story, he's not gonna be able to get to it in this last, last segment of the program, but you can read about it uh, in the book, no fear, uh, but religious freedom and your faith plays a key part in what you do. It does. I mean, entirely. I, as a Christian, as someone who grew up in a small little family, fifteen, uh, in a Christian let, home. Let, <laughs> let's talk about that because that's it's very important for people to know. Your mother um, was your biological mother was uh, was raped, and um, 
yet went through the, the nine months of pregnancy, gave birth to you. You were adopted into a biracial family with 15, you had 15 uh, of you. In there, there. Yeah, it's just 15. Yeah, 13 right. kids, 10 of us were adopted. I, well, what kind of vehicle did y'all get around in? Uh, a maxi van, it was actually called. Okay. <laughs> or a club wagon. There was no such thing as a minivan. That wouldn't have fit all I of us. I threatened to buy my wife a school bus when we had our fifth, but she what? didn't like the idea. Yeah. It doesn't maneuver around so well. Yeah. But um, we, we all fit, and, you know, I had parents who weren't afraid to express their faith, and more importantly, weren't afraid to live it out. And they did that, not just in, in home, because they were the same people at home that they were in the workplace. They, they own a store, a retail store, and they, they lived out their faith in, in the store. So I grew up witnessing that and understanding that there isn't this separation, there isn't this dichotomy that so many of us want to actually impose upon our, ourselves. So what propelled you to step into the public arena in a, in a, I have to say, in a very effective way, but in taking on, I mean, in the book I tell the story about how the NAACP came after you uh, because you challenged the fact that they were promoting the abortion of black children. Uh, you, I mean, that's not like a little organization that you took. No, on. not at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I parodied their name. I, I called them the National Association for the Abortion of Colored People, and for some reason they didn't like it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that was such a wake-up call to me, though. I mean, obviously it was a free speech issue, and it reminded me too, just of religious liberty. What good is religious liberty if we're silent? What good is that freedom if, if we're complacent? And I've just never been the kind of person to just kind of sit back and, and watch things just unfold or be okay with the status quo. So that's, that, that was part of the reason why I, I, my wife, Bethy, and I, who, you know, Bethany and I co-founded the Radiance Foundation, but why we felt like we had to get more involved in this fight, because although a lot of these things seem to be happening beneath the surface, um, there, is, there is a lot of erosion that's happening to our, our First Amendment right. And when I think about it, you know, without religious freedom, uh, America no longer matters. <laughs> without life, nothing else matters. So for me, those two issues, religious freedom and of course the right to life. Without life, you don't obviously have to worry about religious freedom. Um, but those two go hand in hand and that's why the Radiance Foundation really see these things as so imperative and why we have to fight for, for both. What has been your experience? I mean, you're um, young, you've been on the national stage I'm now. You. Well, I mean, you're, young. well, you're, you're, you're younger than me. <laughs> uh, some of my staff is laughing. Don't laugh. Uh, but, I mean, have you been a little surprised at what you've seen on the national stage when it comes to the lack of courage and boldness that Congressman Frank Wolf spoke of? Oh, man. And first of all, I am just a fan. Oh, my goodness. You just are on fire, uh, Congressman Wolf. I, if we had more Christian Americans who actually cared enough, I mean, this is, when you read, um, you know, a letter from a Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King Jr., he was talking about all the complacency of the church. There was no excuse for people to be complacent. And today, there is no excuse for the church to be complacent. We have more access to information than we've ever had before in human history. So it's not like we don't know or that we can't find out what's going on, but it's that complacency, which I understand it from those who perhaps don't know the Lord, for those who, who don't have any kind of religious upbringing or a religious foundation, but for Christians, there's no excuse. This kind of apathy uh, can't be justified at all. I think it goes back to a lack of courage. And there's a fear, and that's obviously why I wrote the book No Fear, because those who are willing to stand up and, and the book is primarily about millennials, younger people. You were an exception. But the, the, <laughs> the, the, the fact that when we have that relationship with God and we understand that we're here for a higher purpose and that life has meaning when we are willing to lay our lives down. And, and that means even on social media, some people are afraid to have people post negative things about them. When people are literally dying for their faith in countries not that far from here, I mean, it, there is no excuse for a lack of courage and boldness. There's not. I mean, if you're afraid of being virtually unfriended, um, perhaps you need to reassess your priorities in life. Um, <laughs> 
it, it's it's really tragic because it's that complacency, it's that lack of courage that to me is antithetical to Christianity. I mean, at the heart of Christianity is self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice unleashes purpose. And when we're courageous, we enable opportunities to happen that allow others to be set free. And so we just need a lot more people, young, old, and all those, those of us in between, to rise up and be courageous. Yeah, it may be uncomfortable, or it may be painful, or none of that matters, because if we're not willing to speak up, if we're not willing to stand up, then we allow this total erosion of freedom and this oppression to sink in, and for that to become the norm. Now, I want to be very candid. It can be difficult to stand up. It can be challenging. You went through that. Uh, you were challenged as you uh, took on the NAACP. They took you to court. Uh, they tried to break you, uh, and it was difficult, but you stood, and you ultimately prevailed. But you know what? When I think of the ultimate sacrifice, Christ gave his life for us, and there are people literally dying around the world. I mean, just trying to, hiding Bibles. I mean, we, we can't even, so many of us can't even understand the kind of persecution and the oppression that happened. So yes, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I will say what I went through is really nothing compared to what many Christians around the world go through. And so, I mean, we're, we're told not to fear. Scripture tells us not to have a spirit of fear. Um, be bold and courageous. And, and what that might look like for one person may be completely different for the next, but we have to be willing to sacrifice. We really do. We have a culture that is in desperate need to understand what gives its per what gives its purpose, and it's certainly not binge watching on on Hulu or whatever else. We have purpose given to us by the Creator, and I just I just pray, like uh, Congressman Wolf said, we have to pray. How can we get involved? How can we step up uh, our involvement and be courageous? You know that Ryan, that is a great place uh, to really kind of begin to wind this down as we. Uh, about to conclude this special edition of Washington Watch to actually just ask Christians, believers, pastors, just as, as Ryan just said, ask, what would you have me do? But then the key to that is being willing to be obedient. And when the Lord answers that question, when the Holy Spirit leads and the door opens, you've got to be willing to walk through it and make a difference. This is a time for men and women of conviction and of courage. This freedom that we enjoy in this country, religious freedom, yes, it's essential, yes, it's foundational, but it can also be lost. Ronald Reagan said it's just one generation away. And these freedoms, if you and I will exercise them and use them, people in faraway places will enjoy them as a result of our willingness and our conviction to stand up. Ryan Bomberger, thank you so much for uh, being with us today and, and thank you for, again for the great work you do on behalf of uh, all Americans, but in speaking for the unborn. It's great to be here, thanks Tony. And folks, I wanna thank you for being such a great audience today and being a part of this special edition of Washington Watch. And I wanna thank our viewers on Facebook as well as all of our listeners on our daily program, the stations out across America. And let me once again leave you with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you have taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is powered by the Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. Again, that's one 866 372 7234